Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to join you today and share some of the um, experiences that we've had working with a focus on self-management um, over the last, um, certainly, 10 years. And I have to say, it's not often, but I'm a little nervous today. So there you go. <laughs> um, what I'm going to try and cover is from a slightly different perspective, maybe. I currently work a lot with commissioners in Yorkshire and other places around the country. And I also have a GP hat on, which in the world of commissioning is pretty important these days south of the border. So I'm kind of going to be using that as our focus as we go through understanding where we're coming from when we're looking at pain, persistent pain across a population, what we need to begin to think about in terms of self-management, and then what is emerging and what we're learning on the way, and also some of the frameworks that are guiding our thinking. Okay, so in terms of healthcare, we always start with our thinking in the commissioning world in terms of health. Hands up those who've seen the rainbow model of health. Hands up. That's not good. Okay? Because when you're working with individuals, you're only on the whole working with this bit and possibly some of that. When we're working with populations, we're looking at health and the wider determinants of health. And what's making a big change for us in Kirk Lees is actually looking at the economic generation to improve income and work possibilities because being in work is healthy. So, please begin to understand that our patients get very distressed when they lose their health, which means they can't undertake their activities, they can't join in a range of social activities with their families and uh, community, they don't get on with the physical tasks that they need to do, they're struggling with pain, and they're certainly feeling quite distressed as they are no longer peaceful or happy or have a sense of vitality. And if we then take this rainbow model of health, which underpins, interestingly enough, WHO's thinking, then this is what happens. This is the multidimensional impact of chronic pain. And you as services, be it me as a GP, or the community pain service, or in any other provider, cannot change all of that and certainly not at the population level, unless we're all working and integrating together. So, I put this picture in because this is kind of what normally happens. And if we're looking and working with people, when they leave the consultation room and don't have an appointment for three to six months, particularly when they see people in clinic situations, um, then they're left to get on with their own. Now, very quickly, in the last eight weeks, we've just found, done some work to find out where do patients learn about their long-term condition in terms of information? What is it I'm dealing with? What's going on? What's the prognosis? Well, it turns out that 50% of the time it's from their GPs. Well, actually, they only see their GPs maybe three or four times a year for no more than 10 minutes. What the hell are we doing? That's less than 30 minutes, 40 minutes time. And it's at best three hours on average in a year that people get contact with clinical services. So they have to self-care. Now, talk to the person next to you, and for a moment, one of you becomes a patient with a long-term condition, and the other person is a clinician. Write down three words that describe to you self-care, and I'll give you 10 seconds. Three words, 
You're either a patient or a clinician. Okay, that's a little bit more. So, when we put up this definition of self-care, do any of the words or the language you use reflect this? Hands up. Where well, it did. Did you have something about action? Something about enhancing health. Preventing problems with health. Rebuilding health or limiting illness. Anybody hands up? Okay. Did you put anything about knowledge and skills? That you and the person you're working with and their family, it's appalling. That's what we heard from some of the earlier talks. It's a pooling of experience, invaluable. And did you pick up on the participative collaboration? It's a bit wordy, but it is WHO. It's been out a long time, this definition. But that means we're jointly doing it together. Now, I think the biggest struggle we've got with the word self-care or self-management is, over the last 40 years, there have been 139 definitions. So you would give up the will to live with that number of definitions. But at the end of the day, this is the one that's coming through. And if you notice the era in which this was done, it's the same decade as the definition of health. If we just go back for a moment, you know, this person was seriously trying to help herself. She was addressing her weight problem. She was doing self-management but she was getting tons of clinical input. Oops. Okay. When we talk about self-management, there's some misperceptions, I think, that they're either doing it or they're getting clinical care. It's not. The person is in the middle of basically a combination of clinical care, some of which has been beautifully described already, and maximising the local resources that may be available in their patch that you may have linked to or they may have linked themselves to. And there are many, many self-care options on a patch. So they're alongside, they're not instead, and self-care can be supported or unsupported, and that's the individual's choice. The other thing that we need to be aware of in terms of self-management, it's doing more of what we know works and why. When we're doing and supporting self-management, what we're trying to do is break it down into four aspects. Helping people to self-assess their needs and issues, helping them to understand uh, and support them in self-managing a whole range of things, helping them to self-monitor and self-evaluate their progress and do it in a self-compassionate way. So if the, we know what works and why, then what we're looking at is being aware that what will facilitate self-management is peer support to reduce isolation. That comes through so often. And I wondered, in terms of people with functional disorders, does it help them to progress by knowing other people have recovered and what they did to make it through? The other thing that helps people, and we picked up on this already, is the issue about being able to advocate for yourself in a very empathic environment. Empathy is strongly related to an increase in self-efficacy. Empathy of the clinical team and ensure that those patients have a better outcome in their self-efficacy levels. People are constantly wanting knowledge, information, tools and skills, and as John um, and um, uh, Audrey highlighted, it's about understanding my condition and why I've got it. Seven minutes. Only see a GP four times a year, and GPs really are struggling to understand chronic pain, and they feel very helpless about it. 
And then there's the other issues as a, here about people making sense of their new identity, letting go of the past and coping with the loss and grief aspects of it. And there are tools that can facilitate that. That's what they're telling us helps. So you can see why we need to take on board self-management practically. And we need to take it on board in terms of a cognitive behavioural approach. And for me, this was a eureka moment when I did my cognitive behavioural training 20 years ago. Thank God, as a GP, they put it all together in one place. Because the biomedical bit isn't working here in Tyneside. There's a load of stuff out there they didn't tell us about. And I never really quite understood what was going on in people's heads and why they were doing what they were doing. And a bit puzzled about their behaviours, but getting my head around them and obviously picking up on moods. Putting the, using this model helps both the person and the clinician to have a common understanding and look to where people can address their priorities and needs and put in interventions. So if we put in a map to guide people in terms of long-term pain management, a map for the clinical team, and this is particularly helpful, I find, for my nurse colleagues, my physio colleagues, um, and um, uh, NHS managers, they now understand what we need to actually be doing within a service, either providing it, who can actually deliver component bits of the service in terms of the intervention. But that's a bit complicated and a bit messy for patients. That works better. Have you got one in front of you? The vicious circle of pain? Should have. It usually comes in the pain toolkit. <coughs> kind of comes like this. Yep, okay. It does seem quite helpful as a self-management tool to enable people to understand their pain experience and engage them. There's no one answer for every person, but it's a combination of approaches that helps. And having a range of tools that can help people understand, take away and think about between one time with the clinician and the next, which has already been emphasised, is crucial. I learnt very early on in CBT from Christine Podesky that the biggest place of change was not in the consultation, even if I did grab another three minutes from the next consultation, but it was in the time between one consultation and the next because you set it up for change. Of course, we've got protocols and principles to kind of guide us. And we've already picked up on the need for collaboration, practice of skills, clear, helpful information about the pain, the condition, and also to focus on a range of goals, particularly focusing on some of the stuff around fear and threat and mood issues. So we've got a reasonably good evidence base behind things. Stephen Morley would say one of the problems is that the fidelity with which we stick to the application of CBT is a problem. And I think on the whole, those of us who are on the, in the CBT world would say that is part of the problem. But we need to keep working with it, improving and refining and looking at the new wave of CBT um, uh, uh, schools that are coming in that are proving helpful. But the other thing that's coming online that we're particularly working on is in how do we make self-management resources to 50,000 people in Leeds, the population of 800,000? Woo! Particularly when we haven't got Diabetes UK, who can put things on the bus, sponsored by Tesco's, was it? And where to go and get help or support or ideas, so we're struggling. So we've got to think differently, and we've got to think in terms of increasing economic challenge. 
So we're looking and developing over the last few years how to ensure that we've got CBT embedded within self-management resources and what do we need to make sure we're doing. And Susan Meekey's model, hands up those of you who've heard about Susan Meekey's Combi model that's come out in the last couple of years. Yep, great, okay. Very helpful stuff, makes you think. And what we're looking at is what do we need to do to make people feel more capable of change? What opportunities do we need to put and share with them? And what do we need to motivate them? Three useful references here at the bottom, particularly useful is the IAPT summary on uh, use of self-help materials. And that's on the IAPT um, website. Okay, so what we've been looking at as we're building a range of resources, both written and now digital, is you've got to get patients on board. And that means we've got to think about how that material is going to do it. And we've got to help them to understand why self-management is pretty good value. After all, just enabling people to understand a little bit more about the value of physical activity, healthy eating, would make a huge single difference to their long-term condition, including pain. We need to make sure things are trustworthy. And when we've done a lot of patient engagement over the last 12 months across West Yorkshire, trustworthiness is crucial. It's got to be credible. There's way too much stuff out there. And it's got to be engaging so they stick with the material and it's got to be trustworthy. And then the other thing we've got, and I work in Brad have worked in Bradford for 18 years, is that actually we've got a horrendous issue around literacy. In fact, I have to speak to my builder this morning because he cannot text me because he cannot spell. That's how bad his dyslexia is. And there are many, many like that. So we've got to make sure the materials that we're putting together match people's capability in terms of literacy. Using different media, we have to be sensitive. And we need to make sure that stuff is in bite-sized chunks. Not photocopied pages upon pages of dense text. They don't do it. In fact, we've just had a usability survey come back when they've looked at a new website that we've developed. And it's quite obvious with eye tracking movement um, technology, they can track what's going on in terms of what people are doing. And they just leave the page if there's too much text. And we need to make sure that what we're doing ensures that they're capable to actually not only be signposted, but actually go to the relevant resources that they choose. In terms of opportunity, we need to make sure that they um, are actively engaged with the material, so they're no longer passive. And that does require some thought in terms of what's going on um, and how you actually create and uh, make the materials work with the individual. Uh, it's very important that they can feel that they can set their own go goals, either supported or um, unsupported, um, and that they can do things and take things away because they can print things out. What's important and interesting is that if you put these materials before people, they often end up trying to do an awful lot of goals, and actually that doesn't work. You've got to help them to actually funnel down to maybe at most three and guide their discovery in terms of making goals with key questions. Motivation. The one thing that comes back time and time again that I find invaluable, and I perhaps might add to a consultation that John showed earlier, is to say, actually, this is what other people with your condition have found helps them build a better life. They want believable narratives. One of the opening things of the pain plan um, workbook on its title, and I'll just go and get it to show you. Do 
It says to the individual who might have bought it via Amazon how people living with pain or could be living with a functional disorder found a better life. The things that helped them and the things that set them back. Therapeutic tone, so it's just stories of struggle and the stories of recovery are crucial. It has to be believable. Therapeutic tone is crucial. Most of the patients that we deal with long-term conditions who see us are in a state of permanent semi-threat or anger. So it's important that we approach them providing a safe, supportive, compassionate tone with a sense of genuineness. And that has to be transferred into self-management, written, digital, or whatever resources. We also need to be optimistic that things can change and offer people ways that they can motivate themselves by self-monitoring and self-evaluation. And we've already picked up about setbacks, but being realistic, that's just part of the journey, and that's just great because now we know more about how you can work with yourself to build a better life. Of course, if we're looking at populations, we've got to think about pathways of care and who perhaps might be working with what groups of patients at which point. Step models are currently in and on the whole make sense. We need to match resources and clinical skills with the level of the severity of impact. And this is currently a useful suggested model. And if anybody wants more details, I have um, more details and you can email me. But what we're trying to look at is in terms of self-management. It's not just about medication, but in terms of self-management, what would we need at which level to enable people to be supported <coughs> and to support themselves? Take control, build resilience. Okay, so first thing that's emerging if you talk to Prof Lewin is choice. It's very difficult in seven to eight minutes in a GP surgery. It's quite difficult in a 30 minute appointment if you're going to share self-management as part of the options that people can work with alongside usual quality clinical care. But they need to know what are the choices and what's out there. So I've summarised on this slide the choices that are available. I would ideally be saying, as a commissioner and writing the contract specification, that these patients come back within a month having determined what their self-management choices are for themselves. There are other ways of doing that, but that would be the plan. Where that has been tried out, it's shrinking the waiting list dramatically. So we've got a range of stuff from books and websites, things online, local expert patient programs, the very rare resource of pain management programs, IAPT are just beginning to tinker with pain, and then there's something about digital resources. This week we had the report from Leeds, and out of 310 people, only 12 had access to some sort of CBT approach for pain. It's never going to be enough, and we're never going to have the staff. We've got to think broadly and widely to supplement. So those are the kind of resources that we've been working on. And in a nutshell, you, most of you will know the pain toolkit. Some of you will know the pain management plan. And some of you will certainly not know the Overcoming Chronic Pain book. Interestingly enough, chosen last year to be GP book on prescription. What patients say are the best tools for them, interestingly enough, from the pain toolkit from a thousand patients, is the need to accept, the need to pace their activities and set goals, and to be compassionate with themselves. So that leads me then to helping you to understand the story behind the pain management plan, what it is, A little bit about what's within it and what we've discovered. And then if we have time, I can share about the 
uh, developments we've got in house for digital versions of pain toolkit and pain plan. The pain management plan came about because in Bradford we had no money for anything in pain actually. And the biggest resource we had was patience. And I was lucky enough to get a small amount of money from an underspend. So that's the tip, everybody. Underspend time's coming up after December. So get your plans ready, because there'll be a bit of money somewhere. Um, and we commissioned Prof Lewin, who'd done a lot of work here up in Scotland. Anybody remember Prof Lewin's work on cardiac rehabilitation? Very good evidence base. And I approached him and said, Bob, I think we need something that reaches a bigger, diverse population than we've got already. I think your work you've done with the cardiac rehab um, resources uh, would address that. Could you do something for pain? And he did. And this is what he produced. Um, there's some copies of it going around. Um, it's a CBT-based book, particularly focused on behavioural change, engaging in the individual in understanding in the first part what you need to do to produce your own plan. It has a CD, which is a stress management program with a range of relaxation um, uh, 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 tracks on it and how to use them and some diary sheets so they can track themselves. The second part of it is covers a whole series of other aspects about self-management for pain. It's in a nice kind of way. You'd like to have that on your coffee table. That's what Bob says. Okay. It's got the cycle. And what it's saying is that Josh here is in the misery cycle. And that's really quick to identify with the individual. Page eight and nine. They don't want to be an eight and they know that. And actually they'd much rather be Josh on page nine. So how do we move them to that direction? And that's what the initial kind of um, uh, uh, session would be on. There's nothing in that that isn't different from normal. But it's in a nice, visually attractive, engaging format. The one thing that's different that Bob's put in is change smart to rest. Rest is realistic, enjoyable, specific, timely goal with specific targets. And he's put in to address the issue around pacing, the effort scale. Many people with pain operate on an effort scale where at one end it's easy and 10 is hard at the 9, 10 end and then they wonder why they fail. But they don't want it, it hasn't got to be too easy at the two, three end, it has to be just about right. And that's been an incredibly important um, uh, addition um, to the CBT content because it gets people thinking about effort in a much more balanced way. So there's a CD at the back. There's part two. The first patient I ever gave this to said to me, wow, I had a marvellous supper last night. I've tracked down the menu and I decided to choose a bit on sleep and a little bit on anxiety and I reread the stuff on medication. It's attractive and engaging and offers people an opportunity and motivates them. They'll use it. We use it and put a whole load of tabs on it and this patient copied and did the sorts of things that we were trying to model to them. And then she realised, using her too easy to too hard scale, how important it was just to add a little extra that personalised it for her, be kind and be realistic. So, 2010-11, three ordinary community pain management programmes in the UK, came together and did just a frontline evaluation. And this was the evaluation. It can be used by people who've got some sort of pain management background. It was used on over 80 patients, different of a range, age range, and um, range of duration of pain, up to 36 years. We had some good outcomes. 
all significant, some positive comments back from the patients, and particularly the aspect around usability. Used face-to-face, -face, over the phone, email, and now increasingly in groups. It's been repeated in different places at different times, and we're still trying to understand the better ways to use it. I'm going to try and show you the video of the first person who ever used it, who came back and saw me and said, I'm really angry with you, Dr. Cole. And I kind of went, oh my God, what's happened? Therapy isn't kind of going okay here, is it? You know what? Why didn't I get this 10 years ago? I went home and I read it and I got out of track and I've had the first decent night's sleep in 10 years years. So let me just try and show you just how Chris's summary of getting his life back. I have to say one of the most challenging patients. He had nearly everything that Bradford Pain Services could possibly offer. Um, and perhaps just reflect on the resilient and compassionate Chris that we have today. Where am I now? Well, it, it, what a turnaround because I've not worked for a lot, a lot of years, and I'm embarrassed to say that, but that's my condition. It, it's how the way I am. Um, I never envisioned where I'd be now. At the moment, I, 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 I've got a smile on the face because I run a, a charity shop, and I manage it, and um, I've, I've passed my retail customer service level one and two, and I'm in charge of volunteers, I'm in charge of work placements. And you know some of the buzz I get from doing that, even though I'm in chronic pain, I can achieve stuff. And now at the moment, I'm doing my management retail skills, a diploma, me. I mean, I, I've got a smile on my face because that, I mean, from where I was to where I am now, you'd never envisioned it. I was 28 and a half stone, I'm still a big lad. But because I move around more and I do certain things, I'm down now to 19 stone. So what I'm saying to you is, is if you get this working here, if you can get that working with your body and you can clear your fog from all the tablets and you can listen to experts, go to a centre where you can do mindfulness and stretching techniques and if it can, and if it can help you, give it a go. To where I was, to now running a, a, a charity shop and in charge of volunteers and work placements and doing a daily job. You know, it gives you a buzz because cause I've not been able to smile or look at people and, and be proud of myself because of the pain where it put me in a dark hole. I am now able to go to work and I have the biggest smile on my face. I get out of bed at four o'clock in the morning, I do my routine and I go to work from eight o'clock till five o'clock and that's my day and I love it. And all that day as I'm doing my breathing and I'm doing my relaxation and I'm smiling. And there's nothing better than a smile because when you smile to someone, you automatically get a smile back. Your body does stuff for you and your mind and, you, and your endorphins light up like a Christmas tree and you know you get this sudden rush that you get you can't get any off a tablet. And you know, when you when you become one, one body and then you turn to two, it's nothing better. That'd be useful, wouldn't it? About how to share in clinics about how someone has made the journey. There's quite a lot prior to that. But that's what we're kind of working on in terms of self-management resources. It's trying to share people's narratives and recoveries, and Chris has put that across, I think, very well. Okay, so a few minutes left. Touch base about the new stuff that we're kind of working on so we can get to more people more of the time so at least they can touch base with valuable, credible resources that might give them the opportunity and motivate them. What we discovered with Leeds in this last week is they do want information, please, 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 please. Can they be involved at times in helping to create that information? They want a menu of options and different types of information so they can access it where they are and not have to keep coming out to see us in healthcare. 
and they want to get a better idea of the, having the right intervention at the right time. We've done some work on trying to shape resources, particularly in a digital format, and we did. So, uh, I've done that work over the last um, 12 months, and um, what they're kind of telling us is they have some value. They can be a useful adjunct to what we're doing, partly because they're there all the time. Hands up whose phone is actually with them at this moment in time. Great. Okay. Hands up those whose phone is not actually with them here. Wow, that's like 1%, I think. Okay. So we need to use something that's here and with them, and carrying that around just doesn't work. So we need them to have something that's accessible and, and available that builds their confidence. And what they told us in the feasibility study is, yes, it does help build our confidence, and it increases our sense of well-being, and we do can use it, and we do use it, and see that 50% every day. And it did help them to set goals and keep them on track with their goals and also alert them to a range of other things like the tension checker, the medication checker, um, and remind them about their goals. And they also suggested things that we needed to change, and we did that. Um, and you can see from the list there um, some of the aspects, particularly around goals and meds. What we found is Further feedback, and that basically, in a sense, it says, yes, goal setting, keep it in much earlier. I need something to track what's going on with my medication, and it helps to reduce medication because they realise they're often overtaking meds. It's not important that they've actually seen the book, the leaflet, or whatever. It's helpful, but not essential. So it can stand on its own. And it was felt by some that actually if they, people had had some sort of understanding about pain management, that was helpful. So that could be part of our clinical role to guide people about self-management. And it should be part of a wider package. IT things like currently in is gamification, com si, com sa. Just some comments from the co-developers of what they found of value in our qualitative feedback. Tension reminder was really, really valuable. One thing that kept coming through. The clinicians also have found it of value and again picked up on the tension reminder and aspects around the goals. So what we've been trying to look at and kind of share with you, particularly looking from a population perspective, is that we're after improving health and well-being that we need to enable more people have access to quality self-management, supported or unsupported, so they can connect with the world around them, give and participate, keep on learning, become much more active and take notice. It's a measure of the health of your population. We're also about enabling personal resilience. And that currently is an emerging theme in the provision of healthcare across, certainly, um, uh, the UK. And you heard that from Chris. So thanks very much, particularly to the patients who've helped us create things that we're doing. To all the clinicians who work with us and work with the pain plan and the pain toolkit. And thank you for hearing and listening to me.